Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Ellie Baumstein, and I work for the Wallace Center, and I'm calling from Washington, D.C., um, and the Wallace Center is uh, supporting you all through the Food System Leadership Network, so this call is brought to you by the Food System Leadership Network as well. Uh, and this is a topic that I'm really excited to explore, and it seems like you all are as well. Um, the the reason why we brought this food banking 101 call together today is because we know that before the pandemic there were lots of efforts connecting local and resilient food systems and anti-hunger efforts but obviously the early pandemic saw a total explosion in those types of programs and now with lfpa and other federal efforts it seems like there's just gonna you know there's no end in sight and so because of that, there's a lot of folks that are coming into relationships with food banks with anti hunger efforts that might not have had that before that might not totally understand how the food banking system works. I am one of those people. And because of all of these new opportunities, because of the sort of growth in this area, there's a lot to learn and there's this sort of paradigm shift that's happening and maybe two paradigms of the local food system and the food banking world that are getting a little closer together. And there's some translation or some uh, mental models that aren't quite aligned. And so the point of the call today is to hear from three folks that are coming from the food banking world, but really sort of understand the local food systems world as well, to break down a little bit of how food banking works, what some of the mental models or the paradigms are that operate in the food banking world and how maybe folks from the local food systems world can make those connections, can build relationships, can kind of understand how that system operates to, to take advantage of it and to start to bring, as I said, those two kind of paradigms a little bit closer together. Um, so with that in mind, I'm going to introduce or allow our panelists to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about who they are, how they came to food bank work and kind of what their position in, in food banking is. Um, so Drew, I think we'll start with you. Excellent. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I appreciate being able to join this uh, conversation today. Uh, my name is Drew Montry. I work as the Vice President of Agri-Food Engagement uh, for Feeding America. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Feeding America yet, we are the largest charity in the U.S. that is working to end hunger, um, and we work with many partners um, across the country. As a national organization, we support 200 food banks and about 60,000 uh, food pantries, agencies, and uh, meal programs. So there's a, a wide reach and I come at this from a national perspective. I um, lead our agri-food engagement team, which is part of our supply chain department. And it's a team of eight, and we are uh, responsible for increasing the amount of produce, protein, and dairy throughout the network. So um, our work is really relevant uh, to uh, farmers and agriculture producers. So I'm glad to uh, be able to join this call. And I will say that I, I come to this work after um, a career in food and agriculture and primarily in local and regional food systems. Uh, so I am a vegetable farmer. Um, I'm participating today from our farm in Bath, Michigan. Uh, which is just north of the East Lansing area. We've been farming for about 15 years. Uh, I spent a little more than a decade working as the executive director of the Michigan Farmers Market Association. So worked with a lot of small and medium sized farmers and communities in this space. And um, although I am not a food banker, I have partnered with food banks um, over the last 15 plus years on programs like uh, SNAP and SNAP incentive programs. And so um, have been working for Feeding America for the last uh, 10 months and uh, really come to this uh, work with a commitment to the mission uh, to end hunger. Um, and also, um, you know, with that perspective of, of creating thriving and supporting thriving farms uh, and agriculture producers. So I'm glad to be able to be part of this conversation. Thanks so much, Drew. Uh, it's great also to have your sort of farming Point of view too because what's really easy for a lot of us to be like well this is what farmers think but i love being able to hear it directly from you 
Um, Dion, do you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your work? You're a farmer. Yeah. Too. So, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Dion Washington, and I'm with the Arizona Food Bank Network. And the Arizona Food Bank Network is a coalition of five regional food banks and almost about a thousand food pantries and agencies. And we work to address hunger in Arizona. Um, together, we, we network with about, well, about five major food banks in the state of Arizona. And we cover about 15 counties in Arizona. Uh, one of the programs that we offer our food banks, we are not a food bank ourselves, um, but we support them, is a program called Friends of the Farm, where we aggregate produce, uh, protein, dairy, uh, and anything else that is naturally produced in Arizona uh, that, that is edible. Um, and we buy it at fair market prices and we donate it to the local food banks and agencies. Um, a little bit of my background, I have an MBA as well as a business degree in um, administration, uh, as well as a lot of other certifications as a farmer. Um, I originally started uh, as a co-founder and a director of operations with a nonprofit called Project Roots. It is a BIPOC nonprofit um, that is in the heart of a food apartheid in South Phoenix. And we were actually recipients of the Friends of the Farm program a few years ago. Um, and since then, you know, Project Roots is no longer a part of the program simply due to conflict of interest, but they've been gracious enough to allow me to sit in this position and now aggregate well over uh, $3 million worth of produce, hopefully with LFPA funding this year. Um, and, and maybe more than that if, if the tribal um, agencies don't apply. So just really blessed and sitting in a place of gratitude today and um, mm -hmm. just being among these wonderful other panelists. And I thank you again for having me. Looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much, Dion. I think, you know, your perspective, having come out of that small organization that's supplying the program and now being able to zoom out a little bit and see a little more of the system as well with the understanding of what it feels like to be a producer is you know just really incredibly valuable and i can't wait to hear your thoughts um heidi i would love to hear a little bit about your work and um your sort of position in the food bank world sure uh, i'm really happy to be here today to talk about how food banks could be an important buyer in the local food system I come from a background of a nonprofit and farm ownership. I do own an organic produce farm. And in the past, we have sold through CSA, we've sold to restaurants, and we've also sold wholesale through a food hub. And I've also held the position of board president for our local food hub. I'm not currently farming, but I do still own and live on our farm in Wisconsin. I am the produce sourcing specialist for a food bank called Second Harvest Heartland that's located in the Twin Cities in Minnesota and I've been there for about 10 years. We're one of the larger food banks in the Feeding America network, and we are fortunate to have resources at our food bank to support a full sourcing department. Um, to, just to give you a scope of our size, last year we distributed about 45 million pounds of fresh produce and about 125 million pounds of food. I mentioned that to just show our capacity and to say that uh, not all food banks have have that much capacity. Uh, not all food banks are the same. So as I share my perspective today from a food bank, it's from the perspective of Second Harvest Heartland. Um, I'll also say that a food bank is not a food shelf. And I have to say when I started 10 years ago, I didn't know that. A food bank is a distributor to food shelves. So our job at Second Harvest Heartland is to bring product in, move it out as quickly as possible, with a strong emphasis on food safety and customer service to our agency partners. We don't call ourselves a warehouse because our goal is not to warehouse food, but to move it out as quickly as possible. So we purchase product at a lower cost because we can purchase in such a volume and we also rely on donated product. And uh, as I'll talk about later, we also do purchase local produce at full price through a food hub. Uh, we engage with about a thousand plus different agencies, which is our word for food shelves and other hunger relief organizations. Uh, they order online through our ordering system. They can see all the products we have. We offer produce to our agency partners at zero cost, even that product that we purchase at full price. And we care a lot about what we call culturally connected items because it's part of our values to meet the dietary requests of our community. 
uh, I secure produce in a number of different ways. One way is through the Whole Feeding America Network, working with those 200 food banks that Drew mentioned. I also, uh, I, I get produce from growers around the state of Minnesota and it's all donated with some reimbursement for some of their cost to harvest and package. So we consider all of our produce donated and then we do some reimbursement anywhere from 15, 30 cents a pound, something like that, depending on the variety. So those are some examples of how we get our produce in. We work at a large scale. So I source in about eight to 12 full semi loads of produce a week. Um, but also just to really emphasize a couple of years ago, we did start purchasing at full price from BIPOC growers through our local food hub that I'm looking forward to sharing more in detail with you. Thanks, Heidi. Mm -hmm. um, so it's probably pretty clear to those of you on this call how these three speakers were selected in terms of you know, their understanding of the world that I you know, come out of the local food system world, but also their deep understanding of how food banks work and also ways that food banks are working to try and buy more local produce to, to make farm viability, to make food systems resiliency in general, a bigger part of what they do. Um, so I'm gonna ask the panelists a few questions and then there's gonna be time towards the end of the call for you all to ask questions. But if something occurs to you as you're listening, throw it in the chat and we'll do our best to get back to those um, earlier questions at the end or you know jot it down and we'll call on folks towards the end of the call. Um, so the first question, and you know, our three panelists can feel free to just popcorn if you feel like you have a great answer, um, is what should people working in local food systems know about food banks? Drew, I'll start with a couple ideas, and then yeah. uh, we could all we can all jump in. I want to um, build off of something that Heidi mentioned in her introduction is that. Food banks across the country um, operate at a vast um, difference of scale. And so they're not all the exact same, just as I would say that like not every farmer's market is the same, not every local farm is the same. You'll see a lot of variety um, in the food bank network as well. Um, and so what is functioning really well in Arizona or Minneapolis might not translate exactly to Michigan or Chicago. And so know there's some diversity in scale and capacity. Um, and you know, so even as you're building relationships, you, what you hear that might work well in one area might not you know, be exactly replicable. The idea, the concept might be, but um, be aware of that. Uh, you also heard um, Heidi talk about food banks, which are, um, you know, the 200 food banks in the country are large, you know, some don't want to be called a warehouse because of, I think Heidi, what, you think, what you're mentioning is that we don't want to be seen as warehousing food. We're sourcing and distributing as quickly as possible um, for people facing hunger. But there are these large warehouses, and then there are many kind of frontline providers. In some states, interestingly, I was just in Washington State a few weeks ago. And they call their agencies food banks as well. So they're food bank and food banks. So there's differences in terminology in different parts of the state too. So, you know, trying to ask, being curious and asking questions if you're not familiar um, with the network so that you can understand function. Heidi mentioned, you know, food shelves, others might call it food programs. And so I think those are some just, I wanted to highlight some differences. Um, you know, I think there's similar functionality um, across the network, but uh, different opportunities in terms of scale and capacity. That was awesome. Thank you, Drew. Um, for, for me, um, I would say really the, the engaging with agency part of it is really crucial. Maybe you have those big major food banks in your state like Arizona um, that, you know, you only have 12 dozen eggs, you know, they, they don't want your 12 dozen, they want like 1200 dozen eggs of yours. But there are also smaller agencies that would really appreciate those 12 dozen. So really knowing what food banks and agencies um, can accept and what they're willing to accept um, and what they're either willing to pay for or even maybe starting out as a donor and building a relationship there, you know, instead of tossing the food that you weren't able to sell at that farmer's market, can you just donate that to a food bank and begin relationship building 
um, that way. So I would say that's my little two cents on, on the, the beginning stages of, of building relationships with these different agencies and food banks. I'll add on that. I, th I appreciate that comment. Um, sometimes I'll get calls from growers who have product that they would like to donate. And if it's not a large enough volume for a second harvest, I will connect them with their local food shelf. So it all, it really is a matter of capacity and size and what people can and cannot take. Um, I'd say one thing that is fairly common across the board though, is how we evaluate our work, the metrics we use. Um, our goal is to move the highest volume of nutritious, high quality food as possible to those in need. That's our mission and that's our goal. And that's how we evaluate our work, pounds per dollar and efficiency to try and meet the demand that the demand is so high. But there has been some shifting in some places on what metrics we use to evaluate our work to look more at uh, where and how we're sourcing our food along with how we're distributing it and how both ends of that spectrum can address hunger relief. You know, Heidi, I'll, I'll build on that. You mentioned, I think at the start, and you know, just again mentioned about how food banks source food. And so, you know, I think that's something that if you're um, new to food banking, it's important to realize how food banks are bringing in food from a variety of different channels. And so, um, you know, retail rescue is very important uh, for food banks working with retailers um, in their communities. There's uh, relationships with manufacturing in some service areas. There's federal commodity programs that are often administered through a state agency. Uh, and those are uh, really important programs for a lot of food banks. They're, Heidi mentioned, they're purchasing uh, through either national or regional models or even uh, very local, working with local farmers. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, just important to note that you might, um, in some instances, you may meet a food sourcer um, who might be one person and, and some food banks might may not even have, you know, someone just in a food sourcing role. And they might be building a relationship with you as a farmer or with farmers that who you work with, um, but they're also in charge of sourcing at a lot of different volumes and scales from a lot of different places. And so I think that's um, important to remember. And then Dion, you also mentioned, uh, you know, one way to maybe kind of enter into relationship building is through donations because food banks that's a commonality uh, food banks rely on and, and work with donors. I would also say food banks rely heavily on volunteers. And so if you know nothing about uh, food banking and it's an area that you're interested in learning more about, there are a lot of local volunteer opportunities either directly at a food bank or at an agency level. And that is a good way to um, start to build a relationship and just understand who works at the food bank and, mm -hmm. and what the work is that they do. Uh, so those could be some easy entry points. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for laying out some of that sort of fundamentals. One thing that you all didn't mention, and I would guess that the answer is probably it varies a lot, but I'm wondering if you could talk about how food banks are funded. Where does the money come from? Obviously, they're you know, buying or getting free food to give it away. So there's a price gap there. And I'm wondering um, some ways that it gets filled. Yeah, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for at least for the few food banks that I've had relationships with and privy to that type of data and information of where they, they, they get their dollars from, it's, it's very versatile. You know, um, I had a conversation with the food bank that the city the Phoenix had $200,000 of money in their budget that they needed to spend down quickly in regards to food distribution. So they just pick the phone up and, and, and call and say, hey, I've got 200 grand. Can you do something with that? And of course, they call us and we reach out to farmers and, and build that way. That's just one of, I'm sure, many different donors that donate to, to that particular uh, food bank. But I was surprised to see that the city actually picked the phone up and said, I've got some dollars for you. How can you help us spend it down and really make sure this food, this produce particularly, is getting to those that really need it? 
That's every nonprofit's favorite phone call. <laughs> yeah. We rely on uh, corporate and foundation partners, which we're so grateful for, and also state and federal funding. Um, Second Harvest Heartland has committed to spending a million dollars over three years to purchase produce at full price from growers of color. So that's about $330,000 a year. But this year we um, ended up having another 200,000 from a state grant that we're using in addition. So that's an example of kind of a combination of uh, places that we've received money for different programs. Yeah, and one of the things that I'll just add on is I, I agree that there's, you know, a lot of different ways in which uh, food banks are funded and uh, through, you know, certainly based on donations um, from a variety of different funders, food and financial donations. But one of the things that I'll just remind people um, is that food banks are uh, independent nonprofits, 501c3 organizations, and just like many uh, local food and farming organizations that are 501c3s. Food banks in the exact same way annually submit a 990. It's all publicly available. And so, you know, if those are things that you're curious about in your role, um, you can act, all of that's public information and you can access it like you would any other nonprofit. That's a good tip. Thanks, Drew. Um, so it sounds like it's a combination of donations, but also grants and maybe individual donors. And then you're dealing with not just financial donations, but also food donations. So that's pretty different than how you know food systems, nonprofits tend to operate with just those individual financial donors or grants from maybe federal or philanthropic sources. Um, so Heidi, you started talking a little bit about this, but this is one of the things that I really wanted to get in with you all, which what are some of the like mental models or ways of thinking or values that are really important to people in the food bank world? I know Heidi, you mentioned dollars per pound or pounds per dollar, mm -hmm. which seems to be the kind of most important, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of, yeah, what those mental models, what the paradigm that food banks operate within is. Yeah, you bet. I'd be happy to talk about that. Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, metrics we use to evaluate our work, efficiency and pounds per dollar are important as we try to provide the highest volume of immediate meals to those in need. And while our mission is to provide as much healthy food and variety food as possible, at little or no cost to our agencies, equity is also a really strong part of our mission. So along with those traditional food streams, we now, as I mentioned, also purchase produce at full price from growers of color through our local food hub. And we are in our second year of a three-year commitment, hoping to go beyond the three years in this partnership. It's kind of a shift and a rethinking of how we look at addressing hunger and what our role is in uh, regards to equity within our community. Uh, this is the first time that we've actually purchased produce uh, and we're purchasing at full market price. So this isn't donated produce, which um, that is something new in the food banking world. Um, our focus here is on economic development, economic justice for these growers who they you know, often face uh, steeper or disproportionate barriers. Uh, and as I said, we've committed to three years. We're in our second year, and this year we'll have purchased about 350,000 pounds, so about $600,000 worth. Uh, this focus on this partnership is uh, looking more at an upstream community development approach to hunger relief versus uh, hunger relief in the traditional sense by looking more at how and where we source product rather than focusing on how and where we're distributing. Uh, we, we see economic development, economic justice for these BIPOC communities as an important way to build community health and well-being. So rather than a return on investment, which is where those metrics of pounds per dollar and efficiency are, we're looking at this more as a return on mission. So bringing more equity into our local community and in this way, strengthening the whole community. And as we look at the intention of the LFPA funds to source from under-resourced growers and distribute to underserved communities, this partnership we have with our food hub, the Good Acre is kind of an example of what that can look like and also just sort of shows um, a shift in metrics and how we, how we measure the programs that we're working on. 
Yeah, thanks, Heidi. So it sounds yeah. like the the level of sort of systems thinking or thinking a little bit more upstream is kind of growing. Um, yeah. Deanna or Drew, anything? Uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, one of the things that I would add to that is I think Heidi's absolutely right. There has been a very kind of, you know, the tr traditional model of getting as much volume as as many pounds for as lowest cost or zero cost as possible. And I think that what we're seeing and the conversations that are happening across the food bank network is that there can be multiple sourcing strategies happening at the same time. And food banks can be continuing to seek donations and uh, get truckloads of donated product. At the same time, and they're also asking themselves, what are the opportunities for us to source for economic mobility in our communities? And not every food bank is there right now. <laughs> um, and, and that's okay. There are people, you know, di different food banks have, um, you know, kind of different ways in which they approach sourcing in their work. Uh, but there are those questions. And Heidi is leading a cohort of food banks who are having these same conversations. And some that have been working in this area, like a Second Harvest Heartland for uh, years and others that are, you know, very new to this work. And I know that some of them are even joining today's webinar. And so I think that mm -hmm. what it shows is that there's just a lot of interest in learning um, and piloting uh, kind of new opportunities and exploring what, what the possibilities are in this space. I, I don't really have much to say. I mean, people said great, great response to that. I will say I visited a food bank a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the donations part of it, you know, and I asked them, how do we not disrupt, disrupt your, your donations once we receive these LFPA dollars and I'm, you know, donating a large amount of carrots, you know, how, how is that is that hurting your your donor that's already with you? And you know that particular food supplier said no, not not at all. Actually, a lot of the food that they donate, unfortunately, isn't edible, and we're having to either drop it off at a farm that could could eat it, you know, with with their their chickens or their pigs or whatever they have. You know, we're still trying to rescue that food, but it's most certainly not edible. And so I think as you're thinking about, oh, well, that, you know, food bank already has a lot of carrots that they get donated. Well, just make sure that those carrots are edible. Maybe they're receiving it and they're getting it right off their dock to a farm um, to give to their animals. So that's just a very small piece of it, um, but something to be to be thinking about. Don't feel like just because there's a big donor there that you cannot still build that relationship of actual edible carrots, just for an example. Yeah, it sounds like that idea of sort of diversification is becoming mm -hmm. more important. So not necessarily abandoning the traditional models of getting, you know, those government products or donations, but creating some more space for other maybe smaller scale or local or more expensive products um, to kind of add to that mix. Um, it occurred to me. Oh, yeah, go ahead. It's definitely a both and not an either mm -hmm. or 100%. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it occurred to me that we've been throwing around the um, LFPA acronym a lot, and I think it's because oh, I've been thinking about that, and I think other food bank folks and probably lots of other supply chain folks have been thinking about it too, but I dropped a link if you're not familiar with that program. It's the Local Food Purchase Assistance Cooperative Agreement, which is a new USDA program um, where the federal government is giving state, gov state agencies and tribal governments funding to buy local produce and then put it into the anti-hunger supply chain. So if you're not familiar, there's a link there. Um, I'm sorry for the jargon. Um, so you all have hit on this a little bit and thank you for the tip that you've already shared. But if I'm, you know, Ellie working in a food hub and I'm thinking maybe it would make sense for us to work with a food bank, um, what are some best practices? How would I start that process? What questions should I be asking my food bank partner or want to be food bank partner? I can share some as an example from our partnership with the Good Acre, who I will definitely give a shout out to right now. The Good Acre and the Twin Cities in Minnesota are a fabulous partner. And we would not be able to do the work we're doing without a food hub because um, it's so crucial. So one thing, because of uh, our capacity and our size at Second Harvest, it would be very difficult for us to get a few cases of various product from a lot of different growers. We rely on the Good Acre as an aggregator. 
we are purchasing at full price from about 60 different growers uh, within our area. And the good acre aggregates that, they palletize it, and they also package it. So it's all consistent pricing and all consistent packaging. Each different variety is on its own pallet. That's what we need at our food bank so that we can manage it through our system, so that we can pick the orders, we can move the orders, that sort of thing. So for us, we, we rely on a, a food hub. We rely on the good acre. We need it aggregated and we rely on those wholesale standards as far as how it's packaged, you know, the cleanliness, how the beets are, uh, you know, banded together, that sort of thing, number of items per box or whatever it might be for the various produce items. So that's one thing I would say, just that aggregation piece is huge for us. Yeah, and, and for me, I would say, you know, the, the modes of communication um, we have here that, you know, a lot of farmers are texters and I'm, I deal with farmers day in and day out and we most certainly, I text them all the time. Um, but it's, it's crucial, I think, for food banks and anyone who's doing business with farmers, you know, we're not just here to purchase uh, produce from our farmers and, you know, give them a check and say thank you, but really educating them on how to make a full business transaction, meaning do they understand what a purchase order is? Do they understand that they have to deliver that food at that food hub or that food bank or that food agency on a certain day and a certain time? Because maybe that agency is cleaning and they can't receive it the day before just because you have extra eggplant. Um, so really, my goal is to sit with the food bank and say, what is it that you're that we're doing right and what are we doing wrong? And so I think any food bank or anyone who's interested in building a relationship, if you ask those two questions over time, they're going to want to continue to work with you because they see that you you may be texters as a farmer or you may be whatever as a farmer. But, you know, if you're doing business, you, you've got to check those emails. You've got to have that purchase order. and It's got to be signed for you to be compensated. And it's just those those tiny things that, that add up once they're looking for their their dollars to continue their work. So I would say just making sure that the proper communication is happening, the channels are happening and all the checks and balances are, are good to go, whether you're donating or providing a service. Yeah, and I think those are really good points. And I think that if I um, kind of take off my Feeding America hat and, and approach this question as a farmer who has a relationship with the Greater Lansing Food Bank, Dion, a lot of the points that you made about kind of communication and asking each other, what are opportunities for us to work together? How can we partner? Um, are really good ways to approach that. And so I will say that as a small scale farm, we make very minimal donations to our Greater Lansing Food Bank. They're, they're two and a half miles from our house and they're very accommodating with small scale, um, unlike you know, food banks that might be bringing in a larger volume. So, you know, we can donate 90 pounds of garlic scapes or 200 pounds of cucumbers, which is an incredibly small amount um, for the produce that they're naturally sourcing, but they're set up that we can drop off anytime before 2 p.m. on a weekday. And they have in their setup, they have agencies that are coming to do pickup. And so they have coolers where if an agency wants a small volume, they can take that with them and they can get it um, to you know people who are facing hunger in a pretty quick way. As a farmer, I will tell you one thing that we try to do is be thoughtful and think about shelf life. And so we do try to not give them product that has a day left on it, like that's probably meant for our compost pile. Uh, we gave, you know, we donated garlic scapes because they needed it. We didn't have cool, we were limited on cooler space. We didn't have cooler space. So they had, and we tell them this has four weeks shelf life on it. We know that as a farm, if we give them cucumbers, we'll say these have five days shelf life. It just helps the food bank know how quickly they need to move it in communication. And then I will also say like, we just ask how can we partner? So the garden project is a program of the Greater Lansing Food Bank. They use our greenhouse when we when our greenhouse isn't full. So if our greenhouse is partially full, we're already running heat in it, we're already irrigating. If they wanna use two or three benches, we they can use two or three benches. We, we do that. Um, we've talked with them about, um, they can, we have some small heads of garlic that they want to have garlic for their garden project and garlic is expensive. And so we can help. We're talking about ways that we could work together. We could either just give them some seed garlic that's small right now that they could grow out over a couple of years, 
or one idea, which we don't know if it'll come to fruition, we could actually grow it out on our farm and then they could bring in volunteers. Harvesting garlic for us on a small farm is pretty labor intensive. So they might be able to help us with all of our garlic harvest. They keep half of it because we grew it out for seed garlic for them and we get some help with labor and harvest. And so those are, you know, just building on what Dion said, examples of ways that we're asking each other, how could we work together um, in this space and help each other out. And so sometimes it's donation related. Sometimes it might be selling product. We have not sold product uh, to our food bank yet, but it could also be partnering on a program that they're offering um, in the community. In our, in our case, it's the garden project. That's a great idea, Drew. I think it's like thinking differently about the assets that a farm has, the assets that a food bank has, sort of what's on the table and how do those assets match up with maybe the you know needs or deficits in your partner. Um, you mentioned something, Drew, when we were talking about this call that I thought was really interesting about sort of seasonality and how those things maybe don't always match up. And again, this maybe doesn't apply everywhere, but I just thought that was a really interesting point. Yeah, one of the things that I was thinking about is um, trying to, if you're build, if you're starting to build a relationship, is being thoughtful of when people are really busy. So I'll just in Michigan, if you are a food banker and you're you're thinking like, oh, it's farming season, and you're just starting to build that relationship, say like middle of July to end of August, and um, you know you're texting my husband who is the primary farmer on our, you know, the primary contact on our farm. And you're texting him every every like weekday morning or or calling him. He's never gonna get back to you. He's harvesting every day. Like those are peak times that are just really busy. And so just trying to think about um, the seasonality. And then I, you know I was thinking about that as farmers in the reverse. Like food banks are often very busy um, right before the holiday season and making sure that their agency partners are well stocked. Um, especially, you know, before like the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. And so just trying to be really thoughtful of each other, of when you're trying to build that relationship. And it might not be when it's most like evident to you, like, oh, sweet corn's getting harvested. I need to reach out to someone now, starting earlier, um, so that you're thoughtful about when people might actually have the bandwidth to give you a call back or to tour your food bank or to tour your farm uh, and just being thoughtful that, of that on both ends. Even if it's just like, thank you, Drew, that's so helpful. And even just like putting it in your crop plan that you intend on mm -hmm. donating that corn, you know, well before you plant the seed and, and build that relationship when you both aren't busy um, is, is key. Thank you, Drew, for, for bringing that up. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point and something, you know, in maybe the local food system world, a farmer in a place like Michigan gets to November and December and thinks, oh, great, now I can start new things. I can reach out to that person I've been meaning to. I can get back to those emails. But for the food bank, that might actually be their busiest time of year. So, you know, being thoughtful about the different constraints on people's time um, during different months. Um, I, would, I would say oh, a lot yeah. of that just it, it's really just about communication, which somebody else brought up earlier. It's so true. I, we're fortunate at Second Harvest that my position is produce sourcing. So I am available when the growers are available. That's part of the parameters of my job. So I, I meet with our growers during the winter months. And for example, with the Good Acre, we sit down in the winter to talk about our purchasing plan so that the, the, the growers can purchase our seed put it in the ground, knowing that they have a market for it and the price. And then for our farmers that donate, just within Minnesota, we get about 8 million pounds of donated produce where we just do some reimbursement for some of their harvesting costs. I, we, um, I connect with the growers in the winter. But again, as it was mentioned earlier, it's about communication. If you reach out to your food bank or food shelf and just ask when is a good time and um, just initiate that connection. And Heidi, one of the other things that I'll add is that um, we do see turnover in the food bank network. Um, and mm -hmm. there are, uh, you know, there are often times when a food sourcer that you might have met and like had established a relationship with could have transitioned to another, um, another job or left that organization. And so don't be afraid if there was someone that you knew um, that left to, to reach out again. And so, you know, I think there's, 
there's definitely some effort in, to be able to you know, make multiple contacts. And hopefully when, if a person that you've been working with leaves, they'll introduce you to some, you know, to someone new that's coming on, but it's not always that, that kind of seamless of a transition. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes there can be a gap. And so don't be discouraged. Uh, if you had a contact and you lost that contact, just make a new contact. Yeah, thanks Drew. It's sounding to me, those of you that attend uh, lots of food systems leadership network calls hear us talk about value chain coordination a lot. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that relationship development, communication, understanding the needs of the buyer and the needs of the seller and doing some of that work to kind of put all of those supply chain pieces together applies to a food bank just as it would to your university, to your restaurant, to your grocery store um, market channel. So I'm seeing some questions um, in the chat. And before we get to those, I just had one last question. You know, Heidi, you've been talking about this partnership with the Good Acre, but I'm wondering, and, and Dion, you've talked about Friends of the Farm. Um, I'm wondering, Drew, if there's other examples of really great partnerships between farmers, between, you know, the local food world and um, the food banking world that you wanted to highlight or give folks a chance to research to get inspired. Yeah, Ellie, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. And I would also just like to extend that to some of the other food bankers who are, um, I know, participating in here. So mm -hmm. I would say if, if others know, please uh, add links into uh, the chat because I think there's a, a lot of good examples. One of the projects that I'll just quickly mention is uh, we have a program called the Regional Agri-Food Distribution uh, Grant Program that we at Feeding America use to support uh, partner state associations and regional cooperatives. And one of the projects um, that is funded through their partial, and they're funded through a variety of different means, um, but it is Feeding Wisconsin. And they have um, developed a partnership where they have indigenous growers who are um, providing about 60% of the product for tribal elder boxes. And so I think those are really intentional uh, types of programs that I feel, um, you know, are inspiring in different ways of sourcing. Um, but, uh, and that's, there are other similar examples, um, you know, like that across the country. And then the other thing that I would mention is that there are also some food banks who have their own farms. Uh, so I think about um, the Interfaith Food Shuttle um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, in uh, Orange County, uh, Second Harvest Food Bank there has a farm, I think it's called Harvest Solutions Farm. And so, you know, there are some food banks that have even had very um, specific ag programs that they're coordinating. Uh, and there's just a lot of really cool examples of, um, you know, how how food bank and the food banking network is investing in local and regional ag and interested in learning more about how it fits into their current programming. Awesome, thanks Drew. Um, yeah, and I saw Dion dropped a link for the Friends of the Farm program. Heidi, I don't know if there's an easy link for you to share and others that know of cool um, approaches that are happening in their community, please feel free to share those as well. Um, so we do have some great questions in the chat that I um, will read. And if you have other ones, feel free to raise your hand or type them out um, and we'll see how many we can get to. Um, so there's a question from Pamela around how to handle, I guess, from a food pantry position, um, what to do when supply is limited. Any ideas for um, how to increase supply? Now, when I hear from um, pantries, that their supply is limited, which is very frequent. Um, they tend to just make sure that I know <laughs> that they don't have a lot of, of, of produce or whatever they buy. Um, sometimes I'm put in a pos position where I have to go to the major food bank that's supporting them to get their green light to drop that food off to them. So sometimes it's it could take anywhere between a, a week to a month to get those approvals, you know, and, and that could delay the, the need. So I would say, be mindful of your inventory well before it gets to zero. Give yourself like a month's time to find those programs that you can move in uh, to help increase. Uh, sometimes I, I have the produce and I'm, I can drop it. And, and most times I, I say, I'm sorry, I can't get anything to you until like next month or, or two or three months down the road. So that would be my response to Pamela's question. 
Another suggestion I might have is something that we tried at Second Harvest Heartland is to connect our agency partners with their local farmers market. Um, and we definitely saw some success there where at the end of market day, the farmer mar or the agency partner would be there to pick up any excess. And it seemed like a win-win on both sides. It did uh, provide more extremely fresh uh, produce directly to the agency partner. It was also helpful for the grower if it was something that they were not gonna try and sell at a market perhaps the next day, they didn't have to take it back home. Um, so just another thought there. Particularly microgreens on that because microgreens don't last long. So if they don't sell them, they have to toss them. Thanks Heidi for bringing that up. Another thing that I would suggest, and we see this um, both at the food bank level and at some of the agency levels is just partnering with other um, other nearby agencies. Um, and so, you know, we are getting more and more asks for shared truckloads and multiple multiple drops. And so are there things that you could um, partner with someone else? If you can't take a full truckload, are there other, you know, are there maybe two other agencies that you could share that with that you could coordinate with? Or how are the things that, you know, what are the types of partnerships that you could build to be able to bring in more, but share it um, in an area? And so those are, I think, things worth exploring. And we're seeing more asks for, um, for splitting truckloads and for greater variety. Great. Well, thank you for those suggestions. It sounds like collaboration, thinking about some new partners, and also being really thoughtful about your planning. Um, so there's a question from Sherry about, you know, Heidi, you were talking about not just focusing on those metrics of, you know, pounds or dollars per pound, but also uh, other sort of economic development measures. Mm -hmm. And so Sherry was asking around that, what tool do you measure um, to, to calculator to capture some of that other impact that's not just, you know, in pounds. And Andrew, my colleague shared an excellent one that's the local food economics calculator, where you mm -hmm. can put in the dollar of local food purchased. And there's a couple of different sort of other parameters that you can change. And then that'll tell you what the economic multiplier of that dollar spent is. So that's a really great tool to understand the impact of your local food dollar. But Heidi and others, I'm wondering, what are some of the other tools you use to capture the value beyond just um, the food donated? That is such an excellent question. And something we're working on right now, since this is a year, we're just finishing up year two in this partnership, we wanna, we wanna capture that data. So along with um, personal stories from the growers, um, some of the things that we are hoping this partnership will do, is it happening? So um, just hearing hearing from those growers. And we also, again, appreciate our partner, The Good Acre, because they're the one that, that can kind of glean those stories from the growers. But at Second Harvest, I'm also working with our senior, senior analyst to determine what metrics do we use and how do we capture them? So we don't have any tools in place right now. We are working again with the Good Acre, their survey that they send out to their growers. We're going to be adding some questions to that. So we're sort of looking at a short term, a mid term, and, a, and then a longer term um, ways to capture this. What can we capture immediately or within the next few months? And then what can we capture when this uh, three years is done and we continue on beyond that? So I'm interested in the link you just uh, put in the chat and I don't have any other tools at this time that I can share, but it's definitely something that we are putting energy towards. Yeah, same for us at the Food Bank Network. We really ask for farmers to give um, testimonials. We have a food bank day at the Capitol with our policy department um, to share those testimonials um, with the decision makers of our, our grants and our budgets that we have in Arizona. Um, and again, thank you for this link. This is very, very helpful. I, I definitely am looking forward to, to utilizing it with this program. I appreciate what you just said about um, sharing this with uh, at, at the Capitol. It leads me to a thought about what's helpful help. And um, if we are, I'm looking for sustainability, uh, long-term sustainability for this type of work where we can really support uh, local food systems and growers of color. And if we are, um, if we have finances to do something like that for just a year or two, the question is, is that helpful help? Um, asking growers to shift their business model and scale up for a short period of time, 
how helpful is that? What we really need is just long-term. So I feel like it's crucial to collect this data and these stories to bring so that perhaps we can even get some funding through the farm bill or at, a, at, at the federal level to make this type of work long-term and sustainable. Heidi, I think that you just made a really good point that is, is worth amplifying. And that's that we're trying to um, make an investment in thriving businesses and supporting the viability of agricultural producers. And so I think from the food bank network and from food bank perspective, trying to be really thoughtful about not just having access to funds where we can purchase, you know, for a short amount of time, but how can we make sure that these are investments, good investments in our communities and good, good lasting partnerships. And so I do think it takes some time uh, to build that and some really a kind of a thoughtful approach to building partnerships as we as we enter this work. Yeah, thank you all. I think capturing impact and telling the story of our work is one of the most challenging and probably important things that we can do because it is oftentimes those ripple effects that are the most impactful and that's what's really difficult to capture. And I'm also, I'm seeing another question um, from Christina about a list or a database and I'll stick a pin in that part, but Wallace Center in partnership with Duke University has been working on developing a survey for what we're calling these farm to food assistance efforts. And if everything goes according to plan, that survey is going to go out on Monday, October 3rd, or definitely mm -hmm. next week, hopefully Monday, um, where we're trying to capture some of the stories, some of the data around what these programs are, how they're getting paid for, how much the farmer is making. So if you're interested and you think it's important for us to have that data, we're going to be sharing that survey and it's going to be really sort of relying on you all to respond to it so that we can capture that, so that we can grab that data and try and present it to people in power to, to use it to make these programs more sustainable. So keep an eye out for that survey. There may be others, there may be other sources of data, but this is the one that we're developing. Um, so just please respond to it. <laughs> um, so to backtrack a little bit to um, Eileen's question about packaging, um, wondering how sort of farmers or what food banks need to know about what packaging is appropriate um, for a food bank partner. I think that's going to be a case by case situation. Yes. It should be one of the golden questions you ask when you're building a relationship with the agency or the food bank. Sometimes they have the staff and the people to take all of your uh, eggs out of a carton or a crate, right, and give you your crate back. But most times they get, they want the whole crate and your food because they don't have the time to do that tiny thing. And that crate is expensive as a farmer. So just really setting yourself up as a grower to know once I drop this donation off, whether it's paid for or not, I'm giving them a box, a crate, I'm not getting it back as far as packaging goes. And then again, just if it's a small agency, maybe they want those smaller packages of microgreens instead of a huge big bag of microgreens that they can dump off. You really should be talking to that agency or that food bank to see what they prefer and do it well before your first delivery or you're going to have a nightmare. <laughs> I would agree with that. I, so we we do a multiple of things at Second Harvest. I I source in a semi load of potatoes every week and they're in the 2000 pound totes. And part of that is because um, that is something that we just do some reimbursement for. Reimbursement is a little less if we can get potatoes in bulk totes like that versus, you know, case packed. And it also provides, um, we have fabulous volunteers who will repack that into 10 pound bags, you know, family friendly bags. So we look at packaging on that scale, but um, in our partnership with the Good Acre, as I mentioned, we need more like the wholesale standards of, is it in a five ninths box? Is it in a one and one ninth box? That sort of thing. And we need it palletized, consistent on a pallet. If it's a smaller grower, I connect them directly with their local food shelf who can probably take it, you know, in a grocery bag, in a paper grocery bag. So back to Dion's point, it's, um, it's just asking the question. Yeah, and I think, you know, for food folks that are used to working in that food supply chain, again, it's really similar to what you would do if you started working with a new customer that's a restaurant, that's a, you know, a hospital, whatever it might be, that packaging, that sort of 
quantity is really important for that buyer to be able to deal with whatever you're selling them or donating in this case. Um, so I'm gonna ask one more question and then I have a couple little housekeeping things to share, but obviously this is a very rich area and we could go on for probably a lot longer. Um, but I saw Elias's question about the communication issues and I'm wondering if you all could talk a little bit about, um, you know, Elias is asking about software platforms or other ways to kind of work through some of those communications challenges. I just uh, submitted a, a link we use here at the Food Bank Network, um, Fusionware. It's a statewide program that's free for all food banks and agencies. Um, and it's the way I put all of my loads from Friends of the Farm and send it to, to food banks and to agencies. And we've only been using it for about six months now. And we've gotten very positive feedback from the food banks. They feel that they can expect, they know what's coming. Sometimes I don't send the email and say, okay, you're getting this many pounds of this, this many, you know, I'm at a farm visiting or what have you. So we went to the state with this software and they agreed to pay for it. So we don't have to pay for it. It's a completely free, trying to get all the food agencies to use it, but at least our major food banks are, and they're quite appreciative of it. You can build product in there. You can send purchase orders out of there. You can mark payments in there. And then of course that food bank knows what loads it's getting on what days. Awesome, thank you. All right, I think I'm gonna pull rank here and uh, end with just a couple little things from us. The first is we have a poll um, that is just meant to ask you all what you learned today. Um, this you know project that we're working on around farm to food assistance is a USDA funded project. And we were talking about metrics before and anyone that has USDA grants know that metrics are really important. So this is really helpful for us. Um, and while that's up, there's a few other things that we wanted to share with you. Um, before this farm to food assistance survey that I mentioned earlier goes out, um, we're also doing a survey that's open right now around the impact of the Food Systems Leadership Network, which is the network that the Wallace Center runs. Um, so if you all are members of the Food Systems Leadership Network, if you've used our services before, we would really appreciate you taking the survey and letting us know what the network does um, for you and your work and how we can continue to uh, be relevant and, and helpful to you. The other thing is we have a discussion group that is meant to house conversations around farm to food assistance that you can go and ask your you know, colleagues, hey, how do you handle this problem? Or do you have a template for this kind of relationship contract? So Aaron, my colleague, just dropped that discussion group in there. So if you have questions that you didn't get answered, please feel free to bring them to that group and hopefully we can keep a conversation going there. Um, the last thing I'll say is that we are launching a monthly community of practice call series around farm to food assistance. So that's going to be every month. And we have two brilliant, wonderful facilitators who work in farm to food assistance that are going to help us design and facilitate those calls monthly. The first one is October 13th. We don't have a registration link yet, but we will shortly and we'll send it out with the recording and all of the links from this call so that you all can um, come and communicate and learn from each other on a monthly basis about these topics. Um, so it is three o'clock. I, that is it for us here today. And thank you so, so much to our presenters. Thanks to everyone who joined us on this call. I learned a bunch, um, and I'm just really excited to continue working with you all and learning more about the connections that we can make between these two sectors. Um, I think there's a ton of potential. And um, I'm just really grateful to Drew, Heidi, and Dion for sharing and for everybody for joining us. And we will hopefully see you all again soon. Thanks, everybody. Happy to be here. Thank you. Bye-bye.